Welcome to this online lesson on the House of Godwin in Anglo-Saxon England. Why was the House of Godwin so important? Our aims are to know who Harold Gods Godwinson was, uh, that's him in the picture by the way, to be able to give reasons as to why he was so important, well it was because of his moustache obviously, actually that's not true, uh, and to be able to support a judgement as to why he was so important. So let's have a look at the start. The House of Godwin. Here's a reminder of some of the main earldoms of Anglo-Saxon England. Northumbria in the north, Mercia in the Midlands, Wessex to the south and west, Kent, which includes Sussex in this map, to the south, and East Anglia in the east, as the name suggests. House in this sense refers to a noble family in charge of a certain area. So the House of Godwin was founded by Godwin of Wessex, who ruled the, the earldom of, of Wessex. However, their influence increased as time went on. The Godwins helped the King of England, Edward the Confessor, to rule England. In fact, one of Godwin's daughters, Edith, even married Edward the Confessor. So let's have a look at what made the Godwins so powerful. You're going to use the information that will appear on this screen to produce an illustrated mind map of the information to help you understand how powerful the House of Godwin was. If you haven't got the video in high definition and you're struggling to read the writing, do make sure that you adjust that setting. So here's the info. The power of the House of Godwin. The Godwins were advisors to the king. Consider how that made them important. Remember as well the importance of the Witan on which the Godwins served. If you haven't done anything on the Witan, then have a look at a previous lesson I did on Anglo-Saxon government and the legal system. The Godwins also helped Edward the Confessor become King of England. Indeed, without their help, it's unlikely that he would have secured that position. Also, one of the sons, Harold Godwinson, was a great military leader. Consider how important that was. Remember, military leadership was really a, a, a responsibility that was delegated to the earls by the king, and so Harold was able to do that. In addition, the, the Godwins had huge wealth. Consider why that made them important. Edward the Confessor had married Edith, Godwin's daughter. This made them important because of what? Well, consider this. Remember, marriages at this time were not done for reasons of love. In fact, there's a lot of suggestion that um, Edward the Confessor really wasn't that interested in his wife. After all, they had no children together, and apparently they never even shared a bed. So, instead, what was the importance of this marriage? Was it just Ed Edward and uh, Godwin's way of securing more power in an alliance? And lastly, we've mentioned that Harold was a great military leader. Well, more than that, he led the king's army and was able to put down several rebellions as well. You should consider this information just to start to what you need to know. Indeed, it's important to do some further and wider reading on this, and you can look at BBC Bite Size to get an idea of that if you need to, and other similar websites. So, get all the information that you need, produce your mind map, and that should probably take you between half an hour and 40 minutes, I expect. So, pause the video now while you complete that. That was quick. I do hope that you've got enough detail. Who's who in the House of Godwin? Well, let's have a look at their family tree. First, we've got Earl, Earl Godwin of Wessex, who married Githa. He died in 1053. However, when he married Githa, he was marrying a Dane, and that was quite a deliberate act. He did that to play, please the then Danish king, who was called King Canute. When I say he was a Danish king, I don't mean that he was king of Denmark, I mean that he was a Viking. So we can see that Earl Godwin and Githa decided to name their children, uh, both with Anglo-Saxon and with Viking names, which is quite a nice touch and shows their shared culture. All of Harold's brothers were given earldoms. Leofwine, which means loved one in Old English. Nice, isn't it? Uh, he was made Earl of Kent in 1057. Tostig was made Earl of Northumbria in 1055 and did an absolutely appalling job of it, to the extent that he was exiled and then later invaded to try and take the crown off his brother. Uh, and we've got Girf, who was Earl of East Anglia, Anglia. And we've got Wolfnoff, who was a Norman hostage from 1051. Wolfnoff sort of becomes important because we think that Harold Godwinson went on a mission to rescue him. Speaking of Harold Godwinson, Harold himself became Earl of Wessex when his father died in 1053. To secure an alliance with Mercia, he married Edith the Fair, who was the daughter of Earl Elfgar. Of course, Harold later becomes King of England, so keep an eye out for that. Pun very much intended. Lastly, we've got King Edward himself. 
He married Edith, who was a daughter of Godwin and Githa, and she became Queen of England in 1045. However, it's unlikely that there was any real love there. After all, it seems that they didn't even share a bed, and they certainly didn't have any children together. It's possible that Earl God um, sorry, King Edward was more interested in religion than he was in his wife. It's also possible, though historians can't prove this, that he simply wasn't interested in women at all. So, Harold's sister had married Edward the Confessor, showing that there was a royal connection between the Godwins and the rest of the royal family. I note too that when I originally took this screenshot, I forgot to get rid of the red squiggly line underneath Godwins, but don't worry, it's not a spelling mistake if you want to use that spelling. So copy the family tree, adding the annotations to show the power of the Godwins in 1060. You might want to add some other details from your uh, previous mind map and from other things that I've mentioned. As an extension, from this family tree, would Harold's claim to the throne be strong or weak? Because after all, when Edward the Confessor died, Harold was the one who claimed the throne and briefly secured it. Well, did he have a strong claim or not? Up to you to decide that. So pause the video here while you complete those tasks. The fact is that the Godwins were the most powerful family in England. So if Harold wanted to be king, he was going to be well supported by the rest of his family and likely quite well supported by the rest of the country too. But he wasn't really family of King Edward the Confessor. He was a brother-in-law at most. But that didn't necessarily mean that he couldn't become the next king. The way these things were decided at this time was rather different to how they're decided today. But that's for another lesson. So where did the Godwins rule? First of all, you need a map like the one on the left. I've included a link to a suitable map that you could print or maybe use on a computer to complete this task. So review your map from an earlier lesson if you've done it. If not, like I say, get yourself this new one. Firstly, label which areas were ruled by which members of the Godwin family. Elfgar was not a Godwin. However, his daughter Edith was married to Harold and his sons Edward and Morcar were military allies. Explain how this shows that the Godwins even had an influence in Mercia. And finally, add Winchester to your map. There it is. This might be what might be the significance of Edward's capital being in Winchester. So complete those tasks so by pausing the video now. Okay, hopefully we've identified all the areas that the different Godwins ruled. And also we've considered the issue of Elfgar of Mercia. Now, although Elfgar of Mercia was a strong um, and noble earl in his own right, the fact that he married his daughter off to Harold suggests that there was likely to be some influence by Harold on Mercia too, or at the very least that Elfgar was allied to him. Not only that, Edwin and Morcar were respected military commanders, and as would become clear in 1066, they too were loyal to Harold. Edward and Morcar are a couple of characters who keep on popping up throughout this course, so do look out for their name. But what is the significance of Winchester being the capital city? Well, the fact is that we associate London with being the capital city, but actually London was a port at this time and not always considered the capital, although it was very important to Edward. He established, for example, Westminster Abbey, just outside the, the city of London. So Winchester, as you can see, is very central within the... Um, uh, the earldom of Wessex, and this shows Wessex as being the most wealthy and powerful of all of the earldoms. So the fact that Edward wanted to establish his, cap uh, his capital in Winchester shows his strong association with Wessex and the Godwins. Now we're going to consider Harold's embassy to Normandy. Now an embassy in this case is a special visit on behalf of a leader. Think about how we use this word now. An embassy is typically a building, often in a capital city, which is a sort of a bit of territory from another country within another country. So, for example, you get the US embassy, which is effectively a little bit of America in London. But in this case, rather than just sending a whole load of uh, diplomats over to live in a building, an embassy was more of a mission. I've included in this description a video which you can uh, watch, which is uh, related to the story of Harold's embassy and what happened on it, because it was quite a complicated story. But based upon this, I want you to record when it happened, why it happened, where did it happen, and what were the consequences and results of this visit. If you're unable to record these details, it's worth watching the video more than once or perhaps doing some further background reading. So pause this video now, play the other one, and have a go at completing those tasks.
This really is only going to provide a very basic introduction to Harold's embassy to Normandy, which is a crucial um, part of our story because of the later effects it has on uh, William the Conqueror's invasion of England. So it happened in 1064, but possibly in 1065. We're not entirely sure. I prefer 1064 simply because 1065 was already a very busy um, year for Harold, and it's unlikely he could have done quite so much in that such, so short a time. So why was he sent? Harold was sent on a mission by King uh, Edward the Confessor, possibly to rescue his relatives Wolfnoff and Hakon, who had been taken uh, prisoner and hostage by the Normans. Or perhaps to offer the crown to William of Normandy. We'll never know the exact truth. Certainly the Normans claimed that it was an offer of the crown to William of Normandy, and the Saxons tended to claim that it was really just an attempt to rescue Wolfnoff and Hakon. So where did it happen? Well, it happened in Normandy itself. And the consequences were actually really significant. On his way there, uh, Harold appears to have been shipwrecked and then captured by one of the, uh, the nobles who was loyal to William of Normandy. This brought Harold into William of Normandy's uh, service and he fought alongside him and was even honoured with a sword, a shield and some armour, which is a really important symbol of actually being a servant of, um, uh, of William rather than someone who was an equal. So Harold became one of uh, William's warriors. Harold fought for William of Normandy and was rewarded with weapons and armour. And Harold made an oath to William, possibly to support him as King of England. Although again, we don't really know about the, uh, the certainty of this. Our main source to go, to go on for this is the Bayer Tapestry, which of course was produced by the Normans. So we've got to take that with a significant pinch of salt. But look at it this way. Harold was desperate to get back to England. He was effectively being kept as a very comfortable hostage of William of Normandy, and perhaps he would have promised anything to secure his freedom. We'll never truly know. Okay, hopefully you've done enough reading on, and background uh, information on Harold's embassy to uh, Normandy. Now we're going to have a look at the rising against Earl Tostig in Northumbria. I said earlier that Tostig was a pretty rubbish Earl, and you're about to see why. So, find your Earldom map. Now draw a clear line showing the Dane law. I've included it in purple on my map. Now define the term Dane law based upon this description. The Dane law was a boundary drawn across England from London to the Mersey. South of this line, the laws and customs would be those of the English, under the rule of the King of Wessex, or by this time, the King of England. The land to the north and east of this line would be under the Viking rule, with Scandinavian laws and customs. Well, truth be told, by 1060 it was all under the, the control of the King of England, but those law, Viking laws and customs still existed. The Viking part of England became known as the Dane Law, the place where the Danes have their laws. So the people in the north followed the laws of the Danish. So, complete task two now. Define the term Dane Law. Here's another opportunity to do some wider reading. There are various revision resources available both online and in books. And I've also included a second link to the documentary that covers the rebellion against Tostig. So the cause of the 1065 rebellion can be separated into these different types. Causes and consequences. The causes relate to Malcolm of Scotland, to taxation, to laws and to Tostig's background. The consequences all relate to how Harold dealt with it, why Harold dealt with it like that and Tostig's reaction. Now, like I say, you will need to do your own research and watch that video in order to get these headings filled in. So pause the video while you do that, and afterwards I'll give a brief summary of each. Pause the video now. Hopefully you've produced quite a nice detailed mind map on this by now, but let's consider the causes just in brief. So, Tostig was a friend of Malcolm of Scotland. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that, apart from one thing in particular. Because he was a friend of Malcolm of Scotland, he didn't really act when Malcolm very naughtily raided the northern areas of Northumbria. Now, it wasn't unusual for there to be cattle raids and all sorts of conflict over the border with Scotland, and that went on for hundreds of years. The difference was, though, the Earl of Northumbria was usually expected to deal with it and at least have a show of force to prevent the Scots doing it at will. Tostig, being mates with Malcolm, did not. Also, if you've been doing English literature on Macbeth, this is Malcolm of Scotland, as in the one who's the son of um, King Duncan who gets murdered in that play. Also, Earl Seward, who's mentioned at the end of the play, was one of the earls of, um, of Northumbria. Anyway, I digress slightly. Then there's the issue of taxation. Under the Dane law, the, 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 Danish, um, the formerly Danish ruled areas of England had played a, paid a lower rate of taxation. 
Tostig had set out to change this, and that had been deeply unpopular. And laws as well. Being a man from Wessex originally, Tostig tried to in, uh, introduce some of the laws of Wessex to the north of England. They were used to their Danish origin laws and therefore were opposed to this as well. And lastly, his background. They simply didn't trust him. He wasn't a northerner like, like them. Although his mother was a Dane, he had never grown up and been raised as a Dane. And so he just didn't understand their culture. More than that, when he, uh, his thanes went to go and speak to him and uh, see if he would listen to their advice, he simply dismissed them. In fact, he wasn't a, um, at all against killing some of his thanes if they stepped out of line. So overall, Tostig did a frankly terrible job of being Earl of Northumbria. So let's consider the consequences. Well, King Harold, um, not King Harold, sorry, King Edward the Confessor asked Harold to deal with it. Now, this was a bit of a risk. Harold was the brother of Tostig, and so how lenient would he be? Well, the fact is, Harold turned up and told Tostig to do as he told, and if he wouldn't, that he would be exiled. And that is actually what happened. Tostig wanted to fight against this, but realised that Harold had the support of the king's army, and so he couldn't do anything about it. He ran off to his mate Malcolm of Scotland, and later to King Harald Hardrada in Norway, with whom he would later invade. So Harold dealt with it like that because he recognised the, the importance of his position over the importance of his relationship with his brother. He knew that being loyal to the king would increase his power and his position within the Witan and within the rest of the nobility of England. Not only that, but his military strength and his show of force in this, this area made him more likely to become king of England next because other people would have seen that he was more interested in the country's interests as a whole rather than just the interests of his own family. So it was quite a good political move. So what was Tostig's reaction? Well, after fleeing to Malcolm of Scotland, he decided he wanted to get his revenge. This was 1065. The next year in 1066, he joined forces with Harald Hardrada of Norway, and they invaded in the late summer of 1066 to try and take the throne off his brother. If that had succeeded, Harald Hardrada would have become king of England, and it looks like Tostig would have got his earldom back in the north of England. But of course that wasn't to be. Instead, Tostig ended up dead. So we're going to complete this uh, uh, work by having a look at a judgment and, ex and uh, an analysis and explanation style question. Explain what made the House of Godwin so important. 12 marks. Here's how you answer this question. It's good to answer it with three point, example, explain and link paragraphs. I sometimes refer to these as peel paragraphs and a short conclusion at the end. Here's how you might do it. I've included this writing frame not because you must use it, but simply because you can if you're unfamiliar with this style and structure of writing. But it's just there for your guidance. Include a point. The House of Godwin was important because... Make the point. Then give an example. Then give an explanation. And then link that explanation back to the question. So if you're not including the phrase, this made the House of Godwin important, at any point in your answer, it's probably not that well linked to the question. So just have a think about that. Once you've done three really well detailed explained point example explained link paragraphs, you can do a conclusion. Overall, the most important reason the House of Godwin was important was, and then decide and just explain it. Or it could be that there's an overall theme that makes the House of Godwin important. I'll leave this up to you. Here's a bit of stuff to go on though. A, re a few reminders of the power of the House of Godwin. And a reminder of the marks too. There are 12 marks in this question. AO1 is all about your knowledge. There's six marks for that. AO2 is all about your analysis and your explanation of the importance of the House of Godwin. There are also six marks for that. So even if your knowledge is amazing, if you're not linking it back to the question, you cannot pick up your marks for AO2. You should spend around 18 to 20 minutes on a question of this length and lay it out in paragraphs. Pause the video while you have a go at that and then afterwards we'll have a look at an example answer. Pause the video now. Okay, let's have a look. Explain what made the House of Godwin so important. What I've chosen to do is I've colour coded my point example explaining link. My points are all in red, my examples in black, my explanation and extra detail is in green, and my link back to the questions are in purple. The House of Godwin was important because they were advisors to the king, Edward the Confessor. An example of how they did this was as members of the Witan. The effect of this was that the House of Godwin were a part of a group of nobles and clergy that advised the king on important matters. This shows that the House of Godwin was important because it shows that they had influence over the king. 
A reminder that in one of my previous lessons, I look at the importance of the Witan. So if you're unsure about that term, do back, go back and have a look. The House of Godwin was also important because Harold was a great military leader. An example of why this is important is that Edward used Harold to deal with the rebellion against Harold's brother, Tostig. This shows that Edward could use Harold Godwinson's experience as a warrior to defend England and deal with rebellions. This shows that the House of Godwin was important because it shows that the Godwins could defend the king's power even against their own family. Admittedly, they weren't in this case um, using their power against their own family. It just turned out that way because Tostig refused to uh, give in to the demands of the king. Thirdly, the House of Godwin was important because they were related to the royal family. For example, Edith, daughter of Godwin, married Edward the Confessor. This shows that Edward wanted to be allied to the House of Godwin, as royal marriages at this time were very political. This shows that the House of Godwin was important, as Edward found it important to formally link himself with this powerful noble family, as a way of securing his reign. Overall, the most important reason was that the Godwins were advisers to Edward. This gave them the chance to influence Edward's decisions. The effect of this was that the Godwins would become even more powerful, and so this meant that the power of the Godwins rivaled that of the king. So, have a look at your own answer, make any corrections that you need to, improve the detail where you need to, and have a look at how I've linked it back to the question. And when you've done that, that's the end of the lesson. I'll say thanks very much for watching, I hope that it's been useful to you, and if it has, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. But for now, I'll say goodbye.